Okay, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to our first VMOVE clinical webinar. I'm Darcy. I am an osteopath that works for Dorsa V. Most of you have probably met me. I am the national training manager as well as an account manager for a lot of the accounts and clinics that you work for. So most of you would have met me in the past. Um, if not, hopefully I'll meet you soon. <laughs> I've also got Tanya Reid here with me as well. Hi everybody, a um, bit of my background is I am physiotherapist and I do a little bit of the clinical training still so there are a few of you that have been around for a little while that I've met and um, sometimes I just answer a few questions for the physios where need be as well so I do run across you here and there. Um, the transmission for go-to meeting is a little bit slow so the videos may look a little bit jerky as we're playing those for you. So don't be alarmed. They don't look like that in real life. And also my cursor as I'm moving it around the screen might move a little bit more slowly than it is in real life. So just be aware of that. So where we're going to start with today is the low back live assessment, the raw data screen for your live assessment. So we will go through that in a fair bit of detail. We won't have enough time to go into the report and extra functions like monitoring and live training. So the topic for today's webinar, as you can see on your screen, hopefully, is VMOVE, improve low back pain, get more out of your VMOVE assessments. So just a little bit of an overview of what we're planning to do uh, in the session today is a little bit of an overview of the standard low back protocol and the data outputs. So you would have seen this before, but we'll go through that in a little bit more detail. We will drill down into individual reps and traces. So looking at the average numbers that you get in your report, as well as looking at each of the individual reps. We'll show you how to edit the test protocol and to make the, make the test more specific for your clinic. And we'll also give you a demonstration of troubleshooting any errors that might arise during a low back live assessment as well. So I'm just going to now transfer into an example of what our um, of what our low back live assessment data screen looks like. So hopefully that's come through for all of you on your screen. So first of all, we're just going to have a bit of a chat through what is in the standard procedure, the tests that are there and some of the data that is presented. So I'm just going to start in the you know, obvious starting position, which is at the top left of your screen where my cursor is, if you can see that. And we're starting with flexion. So for our standard procedure, we normally do three repetitions of each of these standard movements down the left hand side of the screen. Now I'm sure you all know that and I won't go into those in too much detail, but for a couple of them there's a few little tips that we want you to know. So with the flexion in particular, we always ask our patients to reach down as if they're touching their toes, to go as far as is comfortable and to pause for a count of two at the bottom before rising back up into standing straight. Now that's really important because we do need the patient to actually pause when they're in full flexion to see if they can relax their musculature. As you know, we've got our EMG sensors sitting over the erector spinae of the lumbar region. And what we want to see is that the patient can actually turn off that musculature and relax it when they're in full flexion. So you can see in our example here that the green line is indicating the EMG. And you would expect some activation as they're going down into full flexion. Then you would want this green line to actually come back down to zero and have very little activation when they're relaxing. And then you would expect another peak of movement when they're bringing their body back up to standing. This is important and it's represented in the flexion relaxation EMG ratio. So you can see here this patient has a ratio of 2.92, which is very high. You're actually aiming for a ratio of zero. And I think most of you who've done a number of low back assessments, if you've used EMG, this would be quite an unusual finding and something that you don't see a lot. So visually we know that this guy has a lot of overactivity of his muscles and then that's defined in the number score, which we hope for it to be close to zero. So it is getting reasonably high. Um, and just a bit of background on how that's calculated. One of the low back chronic back pain specialist that we work with has looked at this um, through a lot of data sets in a lot of detail as well and has found this to be a common finding with chronic low back pain patients. So it's something that he focuses on and we've included. Absolutely. So with these numbers as well, obviously you've got the numbers represented on the left hand side of your screen and you've also got the traces here in the visual representation. 
the numbers that you've got inside of those each analysis, each of those analysis windows are the numbers specific to that particular repetition. Whereas the numbers over on the left hand side of the screen are your averages for all three reps or however many reps you do. And it's the average that is represented on your report. So when you have a, a person of interest and, and interesting findings, we always tend to like to go back in and have a look at the raw data and have a look at the individual reps to see what's consistent or what's differing. And sometimes, which we will get into later, we also look to change up the number of reps and see how that affects outcomes as well. Yeah, absolutely. So it's interesting in this case, you can see for our patient Travis test here, you can look at the individual uh, reps and you can see that the flexion relaxation EMG ratio, 2.7 in the first case, went up to 3.18 in his second rep and then 2.88 for his third repetition. So you might see that the second repetition was the worst. You may also even like to play your video at this point and have a look at the video representation of what happened in that second repetition and why did that one have the greatest numbers. So keep in mind that coming down and drilling into this raw data is really useful at times. Hopefully that video is playing for you. It might be a little bit clunky due to the GoToMeeting uh, go meeting transmission. Uh, the other numbers that you've got represented there are the same in each of the different tests in the procedure. So you've got the maximum flexion for just the trunk sensor, which is your upper sensor that's sitting over TL junction. You've got the maximum flexion of the pelvis sensor, so that's just the lower sensor that's sitting over uh, S2. And then you've got the maximum flexion lumbar. So basically lumbar is the difference between the trunk sensor and the pelvis sensor. Usually that greatest difference between the two occurs at the end of the range of movement, but sometimes in, a, in an unusual movement pattern it might happen halfway through the movement. One thing that's important to note there as well that we found through being able to map and measure how the pelvis and thoracolumbar junction moves is a, a normative ex, um, uh, expectation is that the movement ratio be two to one for the trunk sensor versus the pelvic sensor. So with Travis, we've got the pelvis moving almost 40 and the upper sensor moving around 100. So we're sort of not far off, but what would be good to see is 50 degrees versus 100. When that starts to deviate, that's something really interesting that you might meld back with your the rest of your clinical understanding about that patient and how this information can relate back and change or aid in your thought processes about how to better manage it. Um, yeah, that's a great tip. Thanks, Tan. Uh, okay, so moving on to extension, which is the next test in our procedure or standard mm -hmm. protocol. And again, you've got those same numbers like the maximum extension for trunk, pelvis and lumbar, which is the difference between the two. And then you also have the EMG activity presented as a percentage. So as you can see in this uh, example here, we're still looking at the green line for EMG. And you can see it stands fairly dormant and then you have a little spike of movement, another spike of movement, and then it's sort of dormant in the middle and then some more spikes. The 20% is basically representing that during that time, 20% of the time there was activation of the erector spinae and 80% of the time it was relaxed. Again, we're looking for a low number here. So you would want this number to be as close to zero as possible. I often get people asking, oh, in the low back live assessment report, one of the alerts that comes up more commonly than anything else is overactive EMG. And that's really because either the patient is activating their erector spinae too much in extension rather than relying on their abdominals to do a lot of the work, or in the flexion relaxation response, they're not relaxing in full flexion and letting that musculature turn off. So that's why that alert can pop up sometimes quite regularly in the reports. And again, it's good to note the pattern across time. Um, most of you therapists may not be choosing to use EMGs with every lower back assessment, and that's fair. Um, but when you do, if you see things like this, you may have an interest in increasing the number of reps to five, maybe even 10, to have a look whether this patient warms up and the EMG levels go down, or whether they become more painful as they increase the number of reps of their movement, and the EMG activity might actually be exacerbated and then that information can be used in your overall management as well. And you can see with um, Travis, his pattern remains pretty consistent across the three reps. Yeah, that's exactly right. Now, if you are planning to do extra repetitions, keep in mind that the report is formatted for three reps, 
but the averages that you'll get are for all of the number of reps and you can look at this raw data screen to see all of the extra reps as well. You'll also notice that in our extensions there, we actually had our patient turn around for his third rep and face a different direction. Now, if you're using the video function within the VMU software, you always have to be aware of the orientation of the patient compared to the camera. Uh, and we were interested in this case, we saw two side on and then we wanted to look from behind. We've also seen different practitioners videoing from different angles, including from above and looking down the back. Um, the other reason uh, I was interested to see this guy turn around is because often in physiotherapy practice, when we're looking at extension, we'll look from behind. Um, and we will cover his raw data lines in relation to his extension um, in a second, just uh, what you can see visually by looking at the, the red pelvic line and the ratio again. So with Travis, you can see the pelvis um, has a seven degrees and the upper sensor has 30. So again, we're looking for that two to one ratio of movement and it gets a little worse into extension. So basically it's telling us that his spinal segments are doing much more of the work into extension and his pelvis isn't contributing. So we might often interpret that as a hinging lower back or um, associated with extension pain. So that's why we got him to turn around to see if we could also see that visually. Yeah, very interesting. So the right and left lateral flexion should be fairly self-explanatory. Just get your patient to stay in that one plane of motion. You don't want them flexing or extending during that movement. We won't go into those in too much detail, but I'll click down onto the anterior posterior pelvic tilt in standing. Now for this one, it's important that we have our patient perform an anterior tilt and a posterior tilt, and then return to neutral all in the one analysis window. With our example, Travis, that you can see on your screen, we can see now he's moving into an anterior tilt relatively easily. He struggles to move into a posterior tilt, but we were, did try to get him to achieve that movement before returning to normal. Now, I should have mentioned back in the beginning that you should all be aware that when the traces move up into the positive space of the graph, it's always a movement into flexion or to the right. And if the traces <laughs> move into the negative space of the graph, it's always a movement into extension or to the left. And with the numbers that you see throughout both the raw data and the report, if there's a negative symbol, it always means it's an extension or a movement to the left. And if there's a positive or, or no symbol, it always means it's a flexion or to the right. So that does help you to interpret the movement pattern as well. Uh, with our anterior posterior pelvic tilt, you really want them to go as far as they possibly can. can. So reaching end range anterior tilt and end range posterior tilt. Anything else to add with the anterior posterior tilt, Tanya? Look, what we do measure is the actual range from one to the other, which is important, but it's where that range lies as well. And with this guy, you can see that he's happy to go into anterior, doesn't achieve much posterior tilt. And that um, may be a bit of a concern. If he did have, for example, extension pain, he's got a, a large lordosis when he arches backwards, it hinges. So we might like to be able to work out why can't he posteriorly tilt in standing and what's precluding that and do we add that in? So again, it's that importance of where that range lies. Yeah, absolutely. It's always interesting to see their starting position. So when you do that initial calibration, how anteriorly or posteriorly tilted is their pelvic uh, pelvis at that position and then how far they can move from that starting point. So going down to our next um, three postures or movements in the procedure or protocol, we've got our three seated postures. Now, these are just static postures. So you always get your patient into their position, then you press your space bar or play button to open the analysis window. So normally this goes for five seconds and it automatically closes the window off on its own. If you want to capture less than five seconds, you can just press the space bar or the next button with your cursor to close that window a little bit faster. For the usual sitting, you want them to be as natural as possible. So try to get them into a fairly stable, flat chair. You don't want a deep seat pan. You don't want anything that's too cushy or soft or on casters so it's moving around. Just like a, a, a small stool with four legs on the ground is ideal if you have something like that. You don't want them using the backrest because that will influence the sensors from the outside as well. You're, usually patients will you know, sit pretty straight when they first sit down. I always make a little bit of a joke with them and say, oh, you know, that's not how you really sit. Pretend you're at home and I'm not watching you. We want to see what's most natural for you. 
this is particularly important if you are planning to do a monitoring session for that patient because you can use these baseline measures to see how they're sitting all day at work or at home. So the slouch sitting posture, basically a slump, so you normally get them to bend forward and keep their head looking forward if you can, but drop their shoulders down. And then upright sitting, sitting up nice and straight. So we're normally looking for when they're sitting upright that they would have some anterior tilt of their pelvis. And when they're in a slouch or slump, they would have some posterior tilt of their pelvis. Yeah, and the upright sitting basically is where we position them because we feel that's the ideal sitting posture. So we're in control of that one. The other two is up to the patient. Um, and while you were moving through those different seated postures, you guys might have um, taken a side look at those data lines and how they spread apart. So. With the slouch, you see there should be the most spread of those data lines and in an upright sitting posture where we have put them where we think it's ideal, they come quite close together. What I want you to take a note of is how close the usual sitting and the slouch sitting actually look visually because if you are monitoring and you get back a report that says this person spent 67% of their day in usual sitting, you go, okay, well that's not too bad because there's not much slouching. When it approaches that slouch posture, which, you know, I see most people, they're almost one and the same, there is a lot to be concerned about. So I always look at the raw data when I'm looking at seated postures, just to make sure how close they are. Yeah, so Tanya finds that looking at the traces are really useful in her case. Personally, I normally look at the numbers in more detail. So I would see here that this patient has, you know, his pelvis is in 32 degrees of posterior tilt in his usual sitting and then only 35 in his slouched and so then the trunk, comparable. yeah, 23 to 24. So very similar in the numbers. So I look at the numbers, Tanya looks at the traces. So that's why it's useful to have both of those on your screen. The anterior posterior pelvic tilt in seated, same as with standing. You want them to do an anterior post, uh, an anterior tilt and a posterior tilt before returning to neutral for each of those three reps and you catch each of those in a separate analysis window. And what you'll see here, in a seated position, that distribution of his range has changed and is more negative or under that um, X line. Uh, and that's because the hips are now tilted up, so totally different start position. But again, what we can see here is going into an anterior tilt is a little bit difficult now for him in this posture and it might be something that's important to rehab. So knowing where he can achieve that range is really important if we're trying to correct seated posture. Yeah, absolutely. So the last two tests here are your rotations. So very basically just asking them to start in a normal position and then rotating as far around as they can to the right and the left. You don't want them to lift their foot up off the floor or their bum off off the chair. Usually you'd look for that pelvis sensor to stay fairly still and you'd be looking at most of the movement coming through the trunk sensor. At the end of your standard protocol, you'll notice that a pop-up box pops up on your screen and it always says review results or view report. I always review my results at this stage. The reason for that is that then you can go through these, you can click through those tests down the left hand side of your screen and you can make sure that your analysis windows are correctly placed. Once you've gone through and analysed all of those and, and placed them correctly, you can always use this report button that's at the bottom left hand side of the screen to then produce your report at the end. So to move these analysis windows, it's very easy, you probably all know, you can either click on the blue bar, click and drag and move the entire window to the left or to the right, so you can see that whole box is moving, or you can click on the little white box at the end of that bar and you can reduce the size of that by dragging it in, or you can expand the size of that by dragging it out. Now what you want to keep inside the window is a movement from zero, all of the dynamic movement and back to zero. So the, the data that's sitting outside of these windows is not being analysed in the report. It's only the data that's sitting inside of the blue analysis windows. And that's why it's important to place them accurately so that the data that's being analysed is accurate data. With this, um, oh sorry, and, and then if you wanted to click through each of the different tests down the left hand side of your screen, you can just make sure that you've placed those windows accurately and that you're happy with the placement and then you can click on the report button. You also have the option at this stage to overwrite some of the tests and to fix any mistakes you may have made. So we're going to go into a live demo in a few minutes and we'll show you how to do that live. But you can have that opportunity before clicking on the report icon 
to overwrite any of those individual tests, if you wish, without having to overwrite the entire proce um, procedure. So looking at um, the graph here on, on the main part of your screen now, you'll notice that the colours of the traces change throughout the different tests in the procedure. Now we've pre-selected the traces that we think are most applicable, and it's these traces that are reported upon in the PDF report. Everything else is being recorded silently in the background, however. So what you may like to do is to come in either during the test or, or afterwards, you might want to come back and review this at a later time, and you can use the legend underneath the screen here to turn on and off different trace lines. So if it's getting a little bit confusing and there's too many traces on, you can simply uncheck some and you can just keep one trace there so you can focus on that. Or you may like to look at something like perhaps at this stage we've got lumbar EMG, both of the sensors at the same time. You could uncheck that and you'll see the green line disappears. And then you can check left EMG, which comes up in a maroon colour and then right EMG, which comes up in a pink colour. And in this case, you can see that the pink trace, the right EMG, a lot of valuable. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this, this makes it even way more valuable knowing the asymmetry of that activation and that on the right side, it's way more active when it actually should be doing not much at all than the left. So um, what was already interesting has just become way more interesting yeah. by looking at it in this way. Absolutely. And another thing I sometimes like to look at in a forward flexion, instead of just looking at flexion and extension of the trunk sensor, I sometimes turn on lateral flexion. Now in this case the blue line is staying very close to zero, but sometimes it'll drop down below zero if they've got a list around to the left, or it'll go up above zero if they've got a list to the right, if there's a painful point in that movement. So they're the sorts of things you might want to come back and drill down into at a later stage. The video as well is also really useful to use. So you can always enlarge the size of that video if you wish. You've got the play button below to replay it and that red line vertically through the trace is synced with the video. And you can also play that at half speed by clicking on the snail icon down the bottom right hand side of your screen. If I click on the snail, that speeds it down to half speed. And if I click on the rabbit, it speeds it back up to normal speed. So the video is really useful for yourself, but also to replay to patients as well. So what we might do now is just go back and have a look at how to edit the test. So if I click back into our subject home at this point, and we click on low back, and then the icon, there we go. So you'll see on the right hand side of your screen, you've got an icon up here saying edit tests. If you click on that edit tests icon, it will take you into our standard protocol and it gives you the ability to change it. So very simply, you've got all of the tests listed down the left hand side of the screen. If you uncheck a box, that will simply remove that test from your procedure. And when that's checked, it's included. The number of repeats are here with the number three in the box. If you'd like to do five repetitions instead of three, you can change that. You've got the repeat end. Now we've got it preset for manually for all of the tests except for those three seated, po seated postures and their automatic end, but you can change that to manual if you prefer. The repeat length is just how long we expect the movement to take, restore defaults if you like, and the click and drag function over the right hand. If you click and drag that down your screen, you'll see that extension and flexion have now swapped order. And if I drag it back up, it puts it back into that order. So if you want to do your seated postures first, you can easily do that by clicking and dragging on the left hand, oh, right hand side of the screen, sorry. Also down the bottom of the screen, you do have the ability to add extra tests. Now don't create a new test, that's quite complicated and I never use that, do you use that, Tan? Never. More easily, you just use this copy test function. So find a test that's pre-existing in our protocol which is similar to the test you'd like to add. So what's a good example here? Look, Maybe. I've seen people look at a fixed flexion movement. So instead of having free range and going as far as they're capable, they stop at a certain point because it's mimicking a role or a task they do at work. And we're looking at what that does to the EMG. So that would be an yeah, example. That's a great one. So I've just selected flexion there. And then if I click on the little plus icon that's right next to that, a new flexion test will get added into our... Uh, into our protocol. So let me just find where that's gone. I'll just scroll down the screen a little bit. There we go, it is flexion copy. So that's appeared here. So then when flexion copy is found, you just click on the little edit button and then you've got the ability 
to, to rename. edit the name and change the instructions. So you might want to write, sorry, my computer's being a bit slow at the moment, but you might want to change that from flexion copy to something like fixed flexion. Yep. And then you could change this instruction to have the distance that you want them to, to flex to. So you can do that for any of the tests. Now, if you're doing something that's similar to the tests we already have included, then that's simple just to do that on your own. If it's something a little bit more complex, then please give us a call or an email and ask us if you think that it's going to be accurate because we'll need to run that past our tech team to give you some advice on whether we think that yeah, we want to make sure that the algorithm that is used within this software will give you really accurate and reliable results with the new tests. So as long as they're comparable, our software guys will give us approval. Otherwise, we'll let you know. Yeah, exactly right. So what I've done now is I've just clicked into a live assessment. We've got the sensors on Tanya's back at the moment just to give you a small demo on if an error is made during the data capture and how to fix it. So what we're doing now is we're opening an analysis window. Tanya's going into flexion and she's coming back up to standing. Now, as we said before, we'd normally have her pause at the bottom if we were assessing the EMG data. Oh, and she's made a bit of a mistake there, so we'll just remember that. And then we're going to do our third repetition and she's moving forward into full flexion. So she's moved around a little bit there. But the idea of showing you this is that what you can do is then have your patient do a fourth repetition and not actually capture it with an analysis window in real time, but just remember that that data is sitting there. And then I can, oh, I'm getting it to do one more. And then after doing those good reps that at the moment are not included in an analysis window, then you can continue with your extensions and the rest of your procedure as it is down the left-hand side of your screen. At the end of your protocol, you can click back onto those flexions, zoom out a little bit, and you've got the ability to move those analysis windows over the good repetitions. So what you might like to do is grab that second, or we'll start with the third window actually, that might be easier, and drag that over to cover the data that's in that last repetition that she did. You might need to expand it a little bit by clicking on the little boxes on the end. Then we'll click on this one and we can drag that over the other good repetition. So you, we didn't have to redo anything there. We didn't have to restart the test. We just had her perform the repetitions without pressing anything in real time but after the fact, we came back and just moved those analysis windows. Yeah, and if you guys are using some of the other test modules where there's a bit more speed, like the knee, often um, patients jump ahead before you tell them to do it mm -hmm. and you miss the capture a little. So this is a way where you don't have to repeat the entire test all over. You can just go back and edit. Yeah, absolutely. Now, if you did want to overwrite that test, let's say that we were doing all of our tests, we went down and did our right and left lateral flexions as an example. We asked her to do a, a lateral flexion to the right, but she actually went to the left. What you could do is you could click back onto it at some point and you can overwrite those tests again. So if you do want to overwrite all three tests, you just click back onto it. You know it's highlighted because you have that blue dot next to it and just press your space bar or your play button and it'll overwrite all three tests. And you start again, start afresh. Exactly. Not all of the tests in the procedure, but just that one that you have highlighted. And then once you've finished again, you can click on that report button at the bottom of the left-hand side and then all of that data will be analysed and put into the report. Now, once you click the report button, you cannot overwrite single tests but you can still go back and move the analysis windows at a later time, so that's no problem at all. Uh, one other thing I did want to show you quickly, we'll pretend we're doing our extension again, so Tan, I'll get you to stand up again. During the movement, if your patient gets pain at any point, you would ask them to yell out a number between seven. 1 and 10. Oh, 7. So all I've done is I've pressed the 7 button on my keyboard, and you'll see that the pain score then comes up onto your screen. Now, you can either use the, the numbers that are on your screen, uh, sorry, that are on your keyboard, and you can just press those in real time, or you've got these numbers up the top right-hand side of your screen. So I can click on the 4, and the pain score of 4 comes up. Sorry, I know it's a little bit delayed on your screen, but usually it's pretty much in real time, so you just press that at the time. 
that's really useful if you've got patients uh, who are referred by doctors, obviously they'd like to see a reduction in pain over time when you're reassessing that patient. Yeah, well any sort of positive marker is great to be able to monitor and even if um, things are plateauing movement wise, a positive change in the pain is something that we'd love to see. So being able to keep an objective measure of that across many months is great. Yeah, absolutely.